back with our next episode of Beyond the Bell. And there's my host, my co-host and colleague, Ryan Welton with the UCLA, UCLA flag flying in the background. And by the way, as we have our get amongst our guests this morning are folks who know how to work keyboards like Ryan Welton. And already I'm seeing things in the private chat. What's great music. Which people don't, I've said this before, but that's Ryan Welton. And with, um, with a, was a sax player, right? That's right. Uh, um, yeah, no, no. It, it's a guy from Oklahoma City named Chris Hicks. Uh, very well known from the 80s, the 90s at the UCO, the School of Jazz, whatnot. Um, and as we've told the story many times before, I've never actually met him in person. Never um, been in the studio with him, right? Uh, ne never even been in the studio. We emailed back and forth. Um, and he uh, he was gracious enough. That song is nothing without him playing the sax. Um, and he is tremendous. Now we should just do a stream at some point about how that you did that. And the, for musicians, the tools that are available, digital tools that you didn't have back when John and Paul were, you know, doing oh, their stuff, right? hundred percent, hundred percent. That would be amazing. Well, today we're going to talk about, uh, the, and we've been highlighting innovations in public schools for the first several episodes today. We're going to talk about innovations in private schools in Oklahoma and they're there. And you know, there's the, the political discussions about schools dominate, but the, the innovations and the things that are happening that actually educate children don't make the headlines as much, right? Right. So we're going to talk a little bit about innovation there, and and uh, you've got some great guests this morning. We've got some great guests. Just a little st stats before we introduce our first panel. We have two panels this morning. As of, as of right now, two hundred ten private schools in Oklahoma. Thirty seven thousand students are being served by those private schools. Twenty seven percent are minorities. The student to teacher ratio is eleven to one, and so there are some really uh, focused schools that do particular things um focus on special needs to stem integration of religious studies and so we're going to start talking about those stories this morning let's introduce our guest uh, without uh, further ado uh, emily jensen is the founder and director of the beacon school good morning emily good morning good to have you thank you for having me matina hunnell and i believe i've got that correct matina is the yes you did good <laughs> founder director of the evergreen academy good to have you this morning thank you and uh, Dr. Logan Crook, who is uh, sporting a uh, hat that I'm very jealous of. Uh, he's the uh, head of the Academy at Odyssey Leadership Academy. It's good to have you all. It's good Thank to be you. here. Excited for this conversation. Great. Mr. Welton, take it away. You bet. And before we get started, just a big thank you to Every Kip Counts Oklahoma for uh, sponsoring these discussions. It's It's been pretty cool because we've we've covered transportation and education and we had a couple of weeks about the aviation programs across the state two weeks ago we talked about public education and now private education gets its moment we're going to talk about innovations at each of your schools so emily you were introduced first let's start with you if you would tell us about the beacon school um, and how and why that got started sure so um, the Beacon School has kind of been created over over many, many years. Um, I grew up uh, with a, a, an amazing public school mother. Um, she taught uh, second grade for 25 years. So I was around, you know, classroom schools my whole life growing up. And um, I actually studied music in college and uh, went and taught in some private schools, um, ran music programs. And so I've just kind of always been around education. And uh, when I had my first child, my, my oldest, my son, um, I started really thinking as a parent, you know, what do I want for him in terms of education? Um, and what do I want that to look like? And so I started doing quite a bit of research on schools in the area, as well as schools kind of across the globe um, and read several books on the subject, um, did a lot of, of research and um, went and started visiting schools and kind of doing my due diligence on, you know, making sure that as a parent, I was putting my child somewhere that I'd feel really comfortable with. Um, and, you know, every school that I left, there were, there were great things. I'm not trying to knock on anyone, um, but I, there were definitely things that I felt could be done differently. Um, and in more innovative ways and creative ways. Um, I really wanted to create an environment where the, the, the child was looked at as an individual, 
um, and where their needs were met as an individual. Um, I wanted to create an environment where the whole child was considered, um, their spiritual formation. Um, the Beacon School is a Christian school. I wanted to make sure um, that, you know, mental, emotional um, development was considered as well as academics. Um, and so balancing those things out, looking at best practices in education, um, you know, a, a lot of what's being taught, you know, at, at, at the higher ed level is not being implemented into our, our traditional schools. Um, and so wanted to kind of bring all those things together into one beautiful special place. And so the Beacon School was born three years ago. Um, and at the time we thought, hey, this is great. We have 15 students. We started in a small little church on the west side of Edmond and quickly discovered that we had really kind of tapped into something really special. Um, and so by the second year, we had blossomed to 53 amazing students. Um, and we're in our third year now and we have 110 students. Wow. So um, it's just been a really incredible journey. Um, and I think the, the thing that's really impacted me the most is parents um, are really longing for opportunities for their children um, and are looking for options that are, that are innovative, that are creative, that are outside the box. And it, it, from the notes that I have here, it seems like one of the innovations, one of the differentiators that makes the Beacon School different are your four pillars. Could you yeah. tell me about the four pillars? Sure. So um, it's uh, questioning uh, is the is the first pillar, which you know this is um, really really important to me. Uh, Margaret Mead is um, a, a great education thinker, and one of the things that she has said is that children should be taught how to think, not what to think. Um, that they need to learn that that problem solving. And so we ask a lot of questions um, at the Beacon School. And um, it's really important that our students have that opportunity to be inquisitive, to be curious learners and not just consumers, not just taking information. Um, another thing, uh, one of our pillars is exploring. And so you, when you come to the Beacon School, um, when we have tours and things, I tell our, our prospective parents, you'll see the kids moving around a lot. Um, they're not just sitting at a desk. Um, they are very, very engaged in the learning process. There's a lot of exploration that happens, um, a lot of creative hands-on discovery. Um, and then the, the next pillar is that discovery process. So as they go from exploration to discovery, um, that's when they really start having those light bulb moments of, wow, this is this is the answer. Um, and it wasn't a teacher who just basically told me the answer or you know dictated to me what what was supposed to happen, but I was able to kind of get there on my own with some guidance and support from from an educator. And then the last pillar is sharing what they have learned. And so we our, our school functions on six week kind of terms. And at the end of each six week term, we have something called an exhibition evening. And what that is, is it's an opportunity for the students to share what they have learned. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about that from some of these other great um, educators because they do the same, same type of format at their schools. Um, but these exhibition evenings are so important because it gives our students an opportunity to really share that, that learning process. Um, and, you know, it's critically important for students to learn how to engage with adults. Um, and this is such a great opportunity for them. So it's kind of like an open house style. Um, you know, parents will come in and, and the students will show and demonstrate the work that they have been working on. Um, and that's essentially how we handle like our grading process is it's, it's, it's demonstrations. Um, so we don't do letter grades like A, B, C, D. Um, we, we allow the students to really demonstrate their learning and their growth through, through exhibitions. And then, you know, obviously our, our educators um, are trained to, to do assessments throughout their time with the students, but um, that's something that makes us fairly unique as well. And, uh, Beacon School, K through 12, are all these schools K through 12? We are not K through 12. Um, we, so we started out uh, pre-K pre-K through third, and we've basically added one to two year, one to two grades per year. So right now we go through sixth grade, next year we'll go through seven. That's fantastic. Matina, I bet a lot of this sounds familiar. Could you tell me about the Evergreen Academy and how it goes? Yes. 
Well, we talk a lot about, I don't know if you've heard of Joseph Campbell, but he developed this concept called the monomyth or the hero's journey. And so I'm thinking of uh, my adventure of starting a school because I didn't ever imagine if you would have told me 10 years ago I was going to be starting a micro school, I would have, my jaw would have dropped. Um, I, my call to adventure was uh, an invitation from Brandon Tatum, uh, where I, I was teaching music at Oklahoma Christian Academy at the time. He planned this really neat summit uh, for educators. Uh, and I went uh, on you know, his invitation and the last speaker of the day was Laura Sandifer, the co-founder of Acton Academy, the original Act Acton in Austin. And uh, everything that she was speaking about was just at a soul level for me, like epiphany moment. And I left there thinking, I think I'm gonna start a school. <laughs> <laughs> um, it resonated this, uh, we're a learner driven model or self-directed learning. And, um, my daughter was at the best private school that we could find. There was so much that we loved about it. There was a lot of forward thinking things that they were doing outdoor education, but it was still the standard grade levels. And so I was really drawn to all of the life skills that are developed in a learner driven environment. Um, the learners come up with their rules and uh, help uh, and you know run the classroom. So they're very bought into their learning experience. Um, we have guides instead of teachers. They have weekly town halls. I was drawn to this concept of learning how to be a contributor to your community and not just wait for you know the assignments to come and you know be spoon fed your education and then you get out into the real world and you're like, so now what do I do? <laughs> So um, I was driven by a love for my children, a, uh, this idea of um, helping unleash potential, kind of thinking of like a garden, our school is a garden, and you know, you're, you're cultivating the soil so that they can flourish, but they're going to be doing the tough work of, of developing themselves. So um, I started the school with my mom, who is also an educator, it's crazy how many things Emily and I have in common, both music backgrounds. Um, I have a, a master's in jazz studies, um, but uh, my mom is an educator. And so we started the school. She teaches the five to seven year old studio classroom. And um, we, uh, this might be inspirational to anyone out there thinking of starting a micro school. We started it out of her home. They have this big, beautiful home on a bunch of property. Uh, so. Uh, we've been on the second floor of their home, and we're excited to be moving this coming year to to expand because um, we're bursting at the seams where we are currently. That's fantastic. So you talk about uh, life skills. What are some of the, the life skills that uh, uh, your brand of uh, education on the model uh, can help people with? Because it seems very self-guided, which seems like it would develop leadership. Uh, and what are, are there other uh, parts of the curriculum that uh, apply to adult life skills? Because, you know, we hear a lot about, boy, I sure wish they would have taught us that in school. Yeah. Oh, so many. Um, we do an entrepreneurship quest, which is project based learning every year for the elementary age. And um, so they're getting to build their own business and put on a children's business fair. Uh, shameless plug for that. If anybody in the community wants to apply, it's coming up June 18th and the applications just opened. Anyone in the community can apply. Um, but they, they build their own businesses and uh, put on uh, you know, for their exhibition um, one of the times that's what they do. And my goodness, talk about applying all kinds of core skills that they're learning academically, you know, learning how to count money and um how to enter you know interpersonal skills as well um and and the neat thing is because we do it every year their learning builds on itself so the first year it might be a bust and you know they lose money and so then they think they they learn you know from their mistakes and when we talk about the hero's journey um that helps normalize growth mindset and realizing okay part of doing anything heroic there's challenges built into that and, and the hero part is learning how to face those challenges and then grow from them and learn from them and keep going. 
Um, so I think that's something. And then at the middle school and high school, we, we eventually will be K-12. We're through eighth grade right now. Mm -hmm. um, they do apprenticeships. And so they get lots of trial runs of what they might actually be interested in doing with their life. Um, I've got a learner that's uh, going to be doing one at the library in the maker space. Um, there's another learner that she thinks she wants to be a lawyer, and she's reached out to Senator Mary Warren, who's been gracious enough and is going to do an apprenticeship. So they're getting all these hands-on, real-world experiences. We believe that the learning is the deepest and the fullest when you're in the real world doing it, which is why project-based learning is so powerful and you know, having your own business. Right. Um, these are life skills that even adults uh, could stand to learn and brush up on, myself included. <laughs> yes. Logan, I'm learning sounds, a lot with them. I, I'm sure a lot of this is sounding familiar, Logan. Uh, if you would, tell me about the Odyssey Leadership Academy and about how uh, your curriculum is transformative and some of the innovations that you've got going on at OLA. Yeah, so again, uh, what you've heard from uh, from Emily and from Atina, it's uh, OLA is following a, a similar path again. Um, about we, we started seven years ago. Um, I've been with the school now for four years um, as their head of academics. Um, and we're, we're a six through 12 school. But um, yeah, the, the innovations that, that we have, again, um, just at the foundation, it's no tests and no grades. Um, the students are collaborating between grade levels. They're they're going to classes together. Seniors and you know eighth graders can learn from each other. And we as as teachers, we we don't call ourselves teachers. We're mentors. Mm -hmm. um, and in the mentoring process, we constantly tell and work with our students as co learners. Um, you know, I I often tell my students, I prepared for this class you know five months ago, reading and, and gathering data. I might have missed something. Um, if you have something that I say and you don't think it's right or you've read something different, tell me, bring it up. Um, let me know because if, if you don't, I don't know. And if I don't know, then I can't change. Right. Um, and so with that, then our classes are very conversative. Um, students are bringing ideas into the classroom. You know, we may set the questions to ask, but very little do we see ourselves as the, the fullness of all knowledge um, in any in any topic, um, and so there, there's a there's a there's a large humility that comes to teaching, um, especially in this mode. Um, and but again, it, it's exciting to to have our students even teach us and and open our minds to to things that we've never thought about before. Um, yeah, so so with that, that's kind of our classroom environment. But we are also a project-based, learner-based school. Um, I'm working right now on uh, shoring up with the juniors and seniors uh, upcoming next year for internships, independent research projects. We call those guided pursuit um, uh, or co-teaching classes alongside mm -hmm. some of the teachers, um, taking parts of the lesson and parts of the week and and crafting that out to, to help lead classes so that they they get the experience of actually leading out and learning. Um, in every class, again, we we want to ground it in the real world. So um, as a matter of fact, I was sitting at a, at a coffee shop uh, on Thursday afternoon. I was teaching a literature uh, elective with students and we were doing word studies, but we had another one of our groups meeting across the way. And uh, they're a design lab class. And they were meeting with a local business and pitching the designs for logos and designs for uh, an, an urban farmer's market in a storage container um, mm -hmm. and, and having real conversation and real criticism coming back to adjust their work. And I, I mean, both praise and criticism, you know, go hand in hand. Um, and, and they walk away understanding what are people looking for. Um, but they also understand that they walk away feeling like they've accomplished something, that they've taken steps in the right direction toward something that could actually be really used in the world. Um, and, and that is actually being considered. Um, so again, one of the things that we work with, with our students is to say the work you do is not just work. Like there is purpose to it. Um, it, we can connect it with other people and it can move beyond you into the world. So, um, yeah. And, and again, one of my favorite questions to ask, and it always so, sort of puts people back, but we do it every year at our school. We gather all our students and say, what do you want to learn next year? just toss out ideas. What are you interested in? Where are your passions going? 
um, and we get this huge board of learn uh, of possibilities for classes. And of course, we can't teach it all. Mm -hmm. um, but that is what shapes what we offer um, in the upcoming year. And then again, as we see proficiency growing in students, we come to them and say, great, you're interested in this. How do you want to do more than just sit in the classroom? Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, we, we are really trying to recognize the passions and the talents of each student, realizing that kids, even at the age of 12 are phenomenally capable of doing real impressive change in our communities of interacting well with our communities um, of taking leadership. And so we, we want to set those opportunities up. Um, and in the end, we found it works. Um, you know, sending them off to college again with no tests, we, we have narrative transcripts. Each kid has about 40 pages mm -hmm. of their transcript that goes ahead of them into colleges that tells the story of every class and how they performed and where they need to grow, where they succeeded, pulling actual examples out of their work to show um, where they've excelled and, and innovated. Um, and across the board, um, college acceptance rates, uh, each student who's applied has gotten in. Last year, we had five graduate uh, go to college and all together they amassed over $800,000 in scholarships. Wow. Um, awesome. doing, yeah, just doing the work, but there is no test, there's no grade, there's no GPA, no ACT, no SAT it's the actual work of their hands and their story right. that goes ahead of them to prepare them in the world. I sort of feel like we could have two hour long beyond the bells to talk to this group because I have so <laughs> many questions. Uh, but what I want to do is follow up, Logan, we'd start with you. What are, what are some of the greatest challenges that private schools like yours are facing right now? And it could be legislature, it could be public in what we perceive, whatever it, it could be tactical but what 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 is the biggest challenge uh ola faces right now you know uh over this year i think the the one word that i give it is trust um do people trust innovation and new things coming up um because people find it's interesting um but again so my my doctoral degree is in like how the imagination works and, and can we actually have people imagine what's possible in a way that they want to pursue it um and and so you know inviting families in um having them see the school having kids interact um as they shadow and kind of learn about what we do but then the question is we've been told so long how the system should work can we trust to ourselves to do it differently mm -hmm. um and and luckily for us in seven years right we the, the proof is there that it does work um but again I, I think the the big challenge that we're facing now especially since over the last two years with the pandemic with the fear that's risen um again that that trust is something that's really hard to uh to foster in people to say yeah we're doing something different and you can trust us we're not dangerous like we feel that the world is dangerous right um and so again it is that that relational connection not just with students but with families in ways that we invite parents in and, and want to ask like, what, what do you want for your child? And how can we make that possible? And how can we build a relationship where you trust us to make that possible for your kid? Um, because we want to do what's best, that, that, that sacred deep work of, of what's best for your kid. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the constant conversation for us. So constant conversations, Matina, that, that you're having uh, within the Evergreen Academy, what what rises to the top of your challenges list? I think Logan hit the nail on the head. Uh, it, and a lot of the work has to do with the parents um, learning to trust their child, especially in a learner driven environment where it's kind of like on steroids, like you're having to trust that they uh, can make mistakes and learn from them and grow and be okay. And that that's actually part of them learning to be, live their fullest life. So a lot of unlearning for the parents because they have all of these preconceived ideas of what they went through and they know certain things that they didn't like about their education, but at the same time, this is how it's done. This is what's culturally acceptable. And so, you know, if you're sending your child to a school that doesn't have the big sports programs and, the, you know, orchestra and things, and you have to think creatively about how you're going to potentially build, fulfill those desires. Um, in addition to 
like Logan was saying, just learning to trust uh, the children and the environment that they're in, which is learning to trust the process. It's a, when you enter an, a, an alternative education school like any of ours, it, you're playing the long game. So in the short term, they're going to have um, potentially freedom shock in our school because they're getting to choose what you know, when they work on math in the mornings and when they work on their literacy or writing. Um, they don't get to choose, they have badges, they have things they have to master, but they get some choice on when and how. And um, so in the short term, that's often messy and they have to make some of those necessary mistakes in that process to learn how to manage their time, how to set goals, how to follow through. And um, so that takes, it's a, it's, but in the long term, they've built all of these life skills that they're going to be using. And when they enter college or enter the workforce, they're going to be so much ahead of the game because they've been practicing that for years. But it takes a trust from the parents because it's so different than the familiar. Right. Trust, trust seems to be the common theme, Emily, at the, at the Beacon School. Uh, is there uh, anything beyond that, anything legislatively happening that is helping? I to did, sorry to interrupt. I did think of one, and let, I'm curious if you experienced this, Emily. I'm sorry to cut off. The, the accreditation process is tricky for alternative education schools. Um, there is one that I have found, Cognia, and we're exploring whether to, to go forward with that. But because we don't have teachers, uh, we have guides. And so we don't require a teacher certificate. Some of them do have it, but that's not the main thing we're looking for uh, to be a really good guide. So that's been a, an obstacle for us because we would love to get access to things like the Oklahoma Scholarship Fund so that we can more easily increase diversity at our school on multiple levels. Um, so that would be one area. What about you, Emily? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely, I agree with you. Um, so one of the things I actually was kind of thinking about is is kind of the concept of school choice, which I know is a very hot button um, issue. So I'm I'm not going to try to politicize this at all. But um, oh, and Scott, if if we need to end, oh, you're fine. Go right ahead. I'm going to make sure that um, you get contact information out there. But please go ahead. We're good. Sure, sure. So just really quick, um, you know. One of the things that I like to do when I'm thinking about kind of challenges and, and how to solve challenges is kind of apply them in other scenarios. So, for example, um, you know, I love ice cream and and I and I go into Brahms and they have like 30 different flavors and it's amazing. Um, and I can choose what I want based on what I'm feeling for that day. Um, and that's a very like trivial thing. But if I went into Brahms and there were only two choices, I would be very upset. Um, and it's interesting to me that a lot of parents haven't quite made that shift to education to realize that, hey, I really only have like a small handful of options, but my child is so important that I should have dozens of options. Um, and so legislatively, I would really love to see us moving toward that school choice um, opportunity, just simply because there are so many parents that are struggling to meet their children's needs within kind of the system that we've created. Um, and so if, if there's more offerings, more opportunities, it certainly would make a big difference on individual students' lives. Well, it's been a wonderful panel. Wish we had more time, a lot more time. Very quickly, Emily, if people wanna know more about um, your school, at um, the Beacon School. Yeah. Go ahead and uh, tell us how we, how we find you, how people find you. Sure, sure. So just, um, we have a website, it's um, thebeaconschool.net. And um, you can also find us on Facebook. We have a Facebook page, um, but yeah, we're pretty pretty easy to find once you, once you hop online. Matina, how do people find you? The trickiest part is spelling Acton. <laughs> they think it's action. Evergreenacton.com is our website. And uh, same, we're on Facebook. And I'd love for people to check out the Norman Children's Business Fair coming up and come to the well um, at the farmer's market uh, in June. And Dr. Crook, how do people find your school? 
Yeah, so um, again, we invite people to actually come and visit. So right now we are uh, at the Cold Community Center in 4400 Northwest Expressway um, by with Oklahoma City First Church of the Nazarene. Um, you can find us online at odysseyleadershipacademy.org. Um, fill out some forms there. If you want to contact us directly, again, um, getintouch.ola at gmail.com is our, our direct email that, that we work with families on. So um, yeah, send an email out to, up to us. Um, they, again, we have about a week left of school, but um, coming and visiting the campus, coming and seeing the classes in action, um, those things are, we, we are very open and to, to having people come and visit, um, which I think is probably the best way to, to actually get in contact and figure out what's going on. But yeah, one of those three ways. <laughs> If I contact you, can I get the name of your haberdashery? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just give it here. It's uh, Hannah Hats out of Donegal, Ireland. Um, so <laughs> I've got about seven or eight of these at home that all different colors and patches to match whatever I'm putting on for the day. Okay, Ryan, we need to make an affiliate link. <laughs> 100%. Well, Scott, you know me and my obsession with caps and other hats. Yes. That's yeah. I need to uh, up my game. Well, it's uh, been wonderful. Thanks for the tip, uh, Mr. Wilton, and I will check that out. Emily Jensen, Matina Hunnell, and uh, Dr. Logan Crook, thanks so much for this, uh, this panel, and we'll hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so there was uh, – okay, that was – we needed a lot more time on that one. Uh, we, we really time. did. A, a lot of common themes, uh, you know, uh, the need for trust uh, among the public, and uh, – uh, attending to students as individuals. And it just, uh, you know, uh, I always felt like I was eight years old going on 40, uh, but uh, really uh, treating students like capable adults and letting them communicate with other adults is just, uh, uh, you know, a fascinating, fascinating concept. Okay, we have a second panel and we have uh, had a little time elapsed. We're gonna bring folks in here. Our first guest is uh, Patricia Filer, who's the executive director of a of Good Shepherd Catholic School. They're a therapeutic academy that uh, makes an environment for children diagnosed with uh, on the autism spectrum. And uh, Pat, good to see. You. We had a little connection <laughs> difficulties, and we think we're through with that. And uh, good to have you on. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm glad we could um, have the camera going. So that's exciting. Very much so. Also, Philip Abode, who is uh, the executive director of uh, Crossover Preparatory Academy in North Tulsa, and uh, and guest. Philip, you yeah. want to introduce your guest, Philip? Yeah, I have my assistant, uh, my youngest child, Truth, with us this morning. Okay, our ratings just went way up. Way up. Okay. <laughs> you know, and also, I think from near the soccer fields, I'm not absolutely sure. Uh, Gina Darby. He's the director, co-founder of Infinity Generation Generals Preparatory School. Gina, are you? Can you hear us? Okay. I'm not sure that she can. Gina, Hello? are you able to hear? Uh, there she is. Good morning. How are you? Um, good morning. I'm here. I'm here, and I'm actually at the at the. I guess I'm at the football field, but it track me. <laughs> Okay. Athletics on, uh, on uh, Saturday morning. Well, thank you all for being here and for panel Absolutely. number two. Mr. Welton, take it away. You got it. And I, th I figure what we do is uh, follow the same uh, format as we did uh, in the last session. I want to talk to each of you about, about your schools and how they got started and your role in it. And also uh, just move right on into innovation. So Pat, with the Good Shepherd Catholic School, very specific mission in terms of uh, uh, therapeutic opportunities for students with the autism spectrum disorder. Uh, how did your school start and how did you get involved? Well, Actually, Ryan, our school started back in 2011, and it was actually a collaborative effort between Mercy Hospital here in Oklahoma City, University of Central Oklahoma, and the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City. And at that time, the um, Catholic school system, the, the superintendent at that time, Dr. Sister Kay Powers, realized that a lot of um, families were coming to them wanting their child to enroll in the Catholic schools, and these are children with autism. However, the Catholic schools did not have services for kids with autism, nor actually did the public schools at that time either. And so because of that, she approached um, colleagues at Mercy Hospital. And again, they had another colleague who was a professor at UCO working with children with autism. And together, they decided that this was a program that they felt strongly enough that they needed to go ahead and launch. And so 
Mercy provided the building, which has been wonderful. And we're still in that same building on the Mercy campus. And UCO provided a lot of our staff at that time because they actually had a major in um, school psychology with an emphasis in applied behavior analysis, which yeah. is the um, okay. method that we utilize here at Good Shepherd. And then uh, Mercy provided a lot of other administrative support. So collaboratively, they were able to launch this program and they started with four kids at that time. And again, that was 11 years ago. And I actually came on board eight years ago. So the program was in existence when I started. And while you mentioned that it's a therapeutic program, we actually um, do replicate what occurs in a traditional school. We have four classroom uh, classrooms and each of them is um, they're at different levels, just like a regular classroom, but it's not based on age necessarily so much as developmental level. And so as the kids progress up the program, they move into the next classroom up. And autism is prevalent throughout our country. Uh, it's actually affects one in 44 children nationally and in the state of Oklahoma. And it, it actually affects one in 27 boys. So it really is, you know, pervasive throughout society. And the program that we have here um, is actually, I know in your last session, they talked about, you know, having individual students recognized with their abilities and kind of um, catering to them. And our program is actually tailored to each individual assessment here because each of them receives an assist, an initial assessment when they start and based on that initial assessment, they have individualized treatment plans. And with that assessment, they're then determined what classroom they go into. They start out in that classroom and as they progress, and um, they we actually have goals set for each of them. And as they master each of their personal goals, as well as the goals for their classroom level, they then are able to move up to that next level. And again, we've been here 11 years. Um, we recently, over a couple of years ago, actually started a clinical program as well. But our school, again, we replicate the schedule of a typical school. We have lunch, for, you know, we have recesses. We have lunch period, although most of our kids bring their lunch. Um, and our, our uh, staff, um, we have our, our entry level classroom has a one to one ratio of one staff person to one child. And as they progress up, our highest level classroom actually has one staff person to two children. So you can see we have a very high staff to child ratio, which is so important in providing that individualized um, program for these children. And um, so because of that, our tuition rate is, is actually much higher than other schools because our staffing is so intensive. However, we're really able to see, you know, tremendous progress made with each of these children. And our ultimate goal is to have these children return to a typical school when they're, you know, at the level that they could you know, succeed in a typical school. So that's our ultimate goal with our program. Would you like to tell us about the OASIS project? Sure. The OASIS project is one that we launched about five years ago. And this, again, was a program that involved our um, clinical director at that time, Dr. Dr. Scott Singleton who's on the faculty of UCO. And what this program involved was we reached out to um, various public school districts throughout the state, the special education um, teachers and directors, because of the fact that we kept hearing from public schools all over the state that they were having issues with children with challenging behaviors, many of whom were children with autism, but not all of them, but they wanted to know how to deal with these children you know, in a very, um, in a very um, positive way. And so, as I mentioned, our school is based on applied behavior analysis, which is a research um, established program that has been very successfully working with children with, Oklahoma, with um, autism. And so with OASIS, we actually had um, our clinical director, Dr. Scott Singleton serving as the trainer for this program. And he actually went out to various regions of the state to provide training in person to the special education directors whose districts had signed up for the program. We then, for those schools who wanted a second level of intensity for this program, we actually had coaches who then went out 
to work with those teachers in their own classrooms with their children to again provide coaching to follow up on the training module that Dr. Singleton had just provided. So we actually, um, you know, worked with them intensely through training and coaching in being able to work with their children and utilizing applied behavior analysis to do that, which is what we use in our classrooms and have such great results with. And as time went on, of course, with COVID, we ended up having to convert the whole program into a virtual program. And so with that, you know, that the, he actually produced training modules that they could then, you know, for each, there were five modules all together. They could each select a module, um, bring that home, view it. And then if they had, were in the coaching level as well, we, our coaches then coach them virtually. But it was a tremendous program. And we actually were able to reach out to um, half of the school districts throughout the state of Oklahoma through that program. And we've actually applied for um, additional funds to um, provide a similar program to the other half of the state and possibly the whole rest of the state as well called Restore. That sounds terrific. And uh, speaking of the term restore, let's talk about the term reconciliation. I, I was looking at the uh, the mission of the Crossover Preparatory Academy, Philip, uh, a Christian organization committed to restoring our community through reconciliation, love, and justice. Could you tell me about your academy, how it got started, and your involvement? Yeah, so uh, Crossover Preparatory Academy is a part of um, our church's broader effort to restore our, our community. We're in North Tulsa. So I'm the pastor of Crossover Bible Church. And, you know, we're in North Tulsa. And, and as you know, under-resourced communities face a lot of different issues. And so when we started the church, we, we realized pretty early on it was going to take more than just Bible studies to see restoration in our community. And so we started a nonprofit organization in 2012 called Crossover Community Impact. And it helped us to take a more comprehensive approach to serving our community. And so we started with youth sports and we have a after school program and summer day camp that hires high schoolers to work as tutors in that program. So it became a youth jobs program. We have a family medical clinic that sees over 7,000 patients a year. We also got into housing, and, you know, remodeled and built homes in the Hawthorne neighborhood. And so it was all around this one elementary school. North Tulsa. And then in 2017, we started Crossover Preparatory Academy. Um, we started it as a, you know, all boy tuition free private school. And so we started in seventh grade, but now we're sixth through 11th grade. And I have our first graduating class next year. And then we did start our a sister school, an all girls school um, with sixth grade this year. And for us, we really wanted to because education is key. And so we wanted to bring the advantages that a private school education can offer young men and young women in our community that wasn't dependent on their parents' ability to afford it. And so our class size is very small and our kids get a lot of, you know, individual attention. And then we're able to talk about the things of faith and, you know, have the truth north as we talk about character and giving our students a vision for the men and, and women that God created them to be. And even though we're a Christian school, we don't require any like um, faith commitment on the part of the families as they come in, but they know that, that we are going to be talking about the things of the faith and the faith as we provide our students with a great education. Mm -hmm. So as and you're talking about the uh, the advantages that a private education affords, and I think you alluded to some of them, uh, but maybe uh, what are some of the uh, specific innovations that are happening um at your program and it, it sounds like a lot of your work is right there in the community are there any innovations what what is that telling or teaching the students who are there right right i mean one of them is kind of outside of the box and that all of our full-time staff are required to live in north tulsa and so when we say restoring our community we really mean it and so our families and our students they know that you know it's more than a job for all of us that we really genuinely care about our community and really hope that they get that too because usually under-resourced communities struggle because all the families who can leave leave and so if we can help our guys embrace wanting to back and be leaders in the community but you know being a, a private school one just the individual attention that our kids get like i said we don't have more than 15 kids 18 would be on the top end on any of our 
and our classes, but also gives us the ability to innovate and to change and to adjust to meet our students' needs. And so just this year, a couple of our science teachers um, piloted a STEM program for some of our students that notice because we were able to stay in, you know, we were able to stay in person even during the pandemic. And so we saw that we had some eighth graders that made some significant gains. And so we wanted to create a program that would push them and challenge them even further. And so we have a small STEM based program. And even just this year on their geometry test results, they started in the fall like 49th percentile. And just now they tested 83rd percentile as a group. And so just being able to change something to push our motivated kids, allow them to see some significant gains this one year. Mm -hmm. And those gains are uh, very unique to the individual as is the teaching that happens in all of these classrooms. Gina, you with the Infinity Generation Generate uh, Generals, the educational arm of the Oklahoma Youth Literacy Program. Uh, philosophy of education is that each student is unique and needs to be taught by dedicated, caring teachers. Could you tell me about IGG and how it got started and your role? So IGG got started in 2018. We received our accreditation in 2021, but we started with uh, youth sports. We saw a need for our athletes to be more educated. And so we have a nonprofit organization called Impact Athletics Incorporated. And we launched a summer program um, a year after that. And it was just summer. Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 5.30. And then we further went into further educating our children by adding an after-school program. And so we now say we're all year-round education because we provide education or we're edu a year-round service provider because we provide education all year-round with very few breaks in between. Just like Mr. Phillips said, um, during the pandemic, we did not stop educating we also expanded to virtual learning and allowed those students that were out of school to come into our school and have some teacher support in their online classes um igg really um i'm actually the founder one of the founders my husband and i um are the founders of infinity generation generals preparatory school and we started this really because there are so many people that don't that that look like us that don't get the extended or extra care that they're needing. And I didn't realize that when I started the school was actually for my younger son. He's a twin to my daughter. But the smaller classroom settings and the extra attention um, opened him up to another level. He's not as shy as he used to be. He actually feels comfortable learning. His frustration level is down. So I didn't realize when I started all this, it was actually from one of my children. Um, Cause out of all my, all five of my, my children, um, he struggles the most, but he's been exposed to so much in the smaller setting that it wasn't just, it wasn't just something that was placed in my heart. Cause we're founded on the foundation is God as well with us. We don't say we're a Christian school, um, but we, we do offer chapel to our students. But I realized that it was for one of my kids too. Um, it makes you go harder when you know it's for, you know, it's someone in your family. Um, and I still would do it even if it wasn't. Um, I came from a background of educators. And so uh, this is just a part of the extension of my life and what needs to happen. I spent 15 years in the military. And um, so that structure helped me to move forward into what we're doing now currently. I think one of the things that's inspiring about talking to all of the people that we've talked about today uh, is just the amount of skin in the game. That they've got it in it if you will um, there is something bigger that is motivating you uh, and with that i'm sure comes challenges or uh perceptions in the community if you couldn't let's start with gina challenges that you're facing right now and it could be at a tactical level but it could also be in terms of public perception what do we the public need to know about the innovations that are happening in private schools that we probably just don't realize is going on well, what I, what I say, and I've said it before, um, what's happening in our communities is that we want to give parents some um, leeway in making decisions over their children. And I'm going to say something that may not always be agreed with everyone, but if we're allowing a parent to make a decision about the gender of their child, we should allow the parent to make an, an, uh, um, an option on where they educate their child. I believe that all schools count. Every school system is needed, public, charter, or private, to continue to enhance our children. Oklahoma's ranked 49th in education. And 
every child does not learn the same. Every child cannot be in an environment or sit in a classroom with 30 students. So many of them are being overlooked. And I believe the private school is not taking away, but it's adding value to our education system. And the challenges that we face, because we're not getting that support from the tax dollars and, and, and the empowerment accounts that haven't been um, um, approved yet through Senate bill, um, it makes it harder for us. Our teachers don't possibly get paid as much or are not paid all the time. Um, our budgets don't always are able to meet the needs because we don't have those additional resources. So the challenges for us, I believe we have the teachers, we have the people, we want to keep them, but the financial piece is what it, it adds. Um, it adds some, some um, pain to what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you very much, Philip. Challenges uh, amongst the innovations come challenges. What are the what do the challenges look like for you? And what is something that the public uh, in the Tulsa area, in the North Tulsa community, in the state as a whole, needs to know yeah. about your academy? Right. I, I'd say two. One on the internal side is you know as you're a new school and trying to create a strong culture. Creating culture is hard. And so as we have our young men and we follow a model where we really want our students to lead and run the school. And so as our guys are embracing that, it's, it's been encouraging to see, but it just takes time and to be able to trust the students and for them to really buy in to what we're trying to do. We're in an old rundown building. And so it's kind of hard to be excited about your school when it's an old rundown building and just some of those challenges. and every guy is excited about going to the school of all guys and so some of those that's a challenge at times but then yeah uh, funding it because you know doing being committed to a tuition free and as we say tuition free but really all of our kids are on scholarship and so we raise you know all the money needed to educate our kids and you know when it became do we go charter or private we decided intentionally to go private because we didn't. We wanted to be able to talk about the things of the faith in the middle of the school day, uh, and so. But that creates a whole extra heavier lift when it comes to funding it. And thankfully, God's provided um, the scholarship, the Oklahoma tax credit scholarship has, has been helpful. But yeah, some of these other deals where we knew right off the bat we were getting five thousand, six thousand dollars per student. That would make it way easier to provide the kind of education that we're providing our students. And Pat, at Good Shepherd, do, do do these do these challenges sound familiar to you? They all sound very familiar to me. And um, again, the financial piece, um, you know, that Gina mentioned and Philip mentioned both. Um, you know, that's that's part of our issue as well as I mentioned earlier with our very high staff. To child ratio within our school. And again, we, as someone in the earlier session mentioned as well, we don't have, we don't necessarily require certified teachers. A lot of our staff are graduate students at UCO in school psychology or special education, but they're all behavioral interventionists because we deal with the children's behavior and help them, you know, um, address that so they then can focus on academics as well. But with that, um, our tuition is very high, so it's hard for people to afford. But, um, you know, the programs that Philip mentioned, the tax credit scholarship, and in our case also, we have Lindsay Cole Henry, which is a state finance program that helps children with special needs um, who can attend private school that might support that issue. Um, but even with that, it's still very pricey to attend. And again, you know, with our OASIS program, you know, behavior issues permeate every school in Oklahoma, pretty much every grade level. It's a very difficult issue that many schools in Oklahoma are struggling with, which is why we launched the OASIS program. So that in and of itself is a program that could help throughout the state, but our funding for that program, you know, stopped at a certain point. And so we're hoping that, that could start again, but you know, even that is a financial issue to launch that program again to help the other part of the state that we have, weren't able to address the first time with that program. So, you know, unfortunately money is the driver for so many things, you know, including areas of education. So I think that's why universally, that's all a challenge we all have. Our program as well is year round because, you know, with, with autism, it's, you know, it doesn't take a vacation and we need to keep the, the 
program going for our kiddos. And so, um, but again, I think we all private schools have challenges. Public schools also have challenges, but ours many times, because we are private, we don't have that automatic federal funding stream that, that the public schools have that really kind of help them, you know, help support them no matter what. So um, we're just very happy that we have the support that we have. And of course, we all attribute that to God. And, you know, as Philip said, as private schools, we can say that and, you know, and have that support too. So we're, I think we're all very lucky from that standpoint, but um, there are times when we, we, we all have issues that need to be addressed to help us keep, you know, keep our doors open. It's been a fascinating half hour. Hey, it's Ryan, been too real short. quick before you go right ahead. Can I, can I, can I say something real quick? Cause I, please, Mr. Please. Phillips said about buying into, um, that's one thing that I think our parents don't understand, especially when you're used to poverty and you're used to not knowing. Um, one thing that we had a, a problem with was Senate bill 1647. A lot of our parents did not know that you have to continue to bug your legislators. You have to go down to the Capitol. You have to make your voice heard that if your child needs this type of education, go let your voice be heard. Some of us are so used to being in poverty that we, we ignore the fact that we our voices can be heard, that we're, we have a right to vote these people in that are going to support the things that we need for our kids. And so one of the challenges we face is changing the mindset of our parents to go fight for what you believe your child deserves. I think that that sounds exactly like we should, Gina, we should put at the end of that. I'm Gina Darby and I approve this message. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was really good. Hey, can we start? Uh, <laughs> let's start go because we want to make sure everybody can find you folks. If they have questions, Gina, can we start with you? How do people find out about uh, your school? And if they want to talk yes, to you, how do they find um, you? Gina Darby, let me say, Okay, um, I want to first say thank you to Echo for allowing me to be a part of this, and thank you all for allowing us to be on. Infinity Generation Generals Preparatory School is located in Northeast Shopping Center, and we'll be moving to Northwest 23rd, 5517 Northwest 23rd this summer to an, uh, a bigger space. Um, but you can reach us at www.iggokc.org. That's www.iggokc.org. Info at iggokc.org. Or our number is 405-601-3055. Again, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this discussion today. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. By the way, how, uh, Gina, how are we doing on the track meet? Are we winning? So far, um, my 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 first son is, what was what did he get? They were in first place on the run, but they have to do the four by one again to qualify for state. So, so far we're doing pretty good. <laughs> okay. It's winning. It's at the track meet. Good. That's good to hear. Um, uh, Pat, go ahead and tell our listeners and viewers where they could find you more about your Academy. Okay, great. Um, again, we are actually located on the mercy hospital campus in Oklahoma city on the Meridian side of the campus. And our website is good shepherd. And that's S H E P H E R D C S for Catholic School dot org. Again, Good Shepherd C S dot org is our website address. And if they want to give us a call, it's 405 752 2264 here in Oklahoma City. And again, we're located at 13404 North Meridian, right on the Mercy Hospital campus. And we look forward to talking to anyone about their particular situation or what they might be facing in a school situation we'll be happy to talk to you and, and see if we can help you thank you pat and uh philip uh, how do people find you yeah so we're located in north tulsa but the easiest way is our website crossoverprep.org or our nonprofit's website is crossoverimpact.org so either one of those will direct to our school all right thank you all pat filer Philip Abode, Gina Darby from the track and field beat. So good to have you all three on and look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thank you. And thank you, Channel 9. Thanks, and thank you, Echo. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank, thank you, you all. Channel 9. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Y'all have a blessed uh, rest of the day. You do too. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. See ya. Goodbye. All right. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Welton. 
that was uh, those were two good panels. Well, I told you uh, b before we got on air, you know what my plans were for the weekend, and you know I just thought to myself, "Boy, I sure am working hard." No, 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 no. These folks are are, are working hard, and uh, it's I think it's all uh, stems from you know personal missions and personal circumstances and thinking about uh, things beyond themselves, and uh, it's just been. Uh, I think we could have gone on for two or three hours because every question that I had led to something else that I wanted to ask. Um, and these are things, you know, we're, uh, we have news on six in Tulsa. Um, we're right there in Guthrie green. We've got news nine in Oklahoma city. Um, and I, you know, I just wasn't educated, uh, that these schools existed or what they were doing. So it was good to hear at a very specific level, just what some, some of the options are out there. And I'm just, uh, very impressed with the passion, that everybody uh, comes to the table with when it comes to uh, their individual schools. They're all working for a higher purpose. As a very old person, and I look back on, on, on these sorts of stories and what we've done today, and I look at the media coverage, the, the media does focus, and it's where the most noise is, right. is on the political aspect of these things. And that's the, the way there is an inexhaustible mm -hmm. amount of topics there is not an inexha inexhaustible amount of journalists to cover right. these sort right. of issues or commentators or analysts. There's just not enough time, not enough people to cover these. So that's what we're trying to do is basically bring these better conversations forward and to really look at what people are doing behind the headlines. And this, it's been fascinating. It really has been fascinating. And so it's one of those, when you start getting into beyond the headlines and see what people are doing in every single day. And Gina was passionate. She's like, you've got to engage where you're at with the folks that are making a lot of the policy decisions. And oh my goodness, are, are the, the headlines, sometimes they're toxic. Sometimes these stories are sensational, but at the end of the day, we've talked to six people today who are busy doing what they're doing and helping people. And it was really enjoyable. And I would say yeah, it's, I, I'm inspired by the spark that happens in an individual when they decide, you know what, I'm going to do something myself. And each one of these people at their on their road of life and their experience with their kids and their community at some point said, you know what, I'm going to do it myself. Yeah. You know, Vaynerchuk begins all of his, so I'm, you know, fanboy of Gary Vaynerchuk and right. it begins, he's all his, his, don't you want to be happy? Right. Mm -hmm. And be happy in what you're doing. And people that are not worried about Instagram worlds and you know the, the the fake world that we see people trying to put in. These people are legit genuine. And this has been every one of our episodes on Beyond the Bell. I'm I'm if we got into the politics, we'd probably find more disagreements. But what we find is we find educators who are passionate about helping people learn. And yep. that's inspiring, as you say. Uh, agreements and common themes and uh just grateful to uh, every kid counts Oklahoma for uh, allowing us to, to put this on. And of course, we always talk about this at the uh, uh, end of our broadcast. As soon as we're done here, we're going to get this on the news nine and news on six websites, our news app, our streaming app. I'm uh, having more and more conversations with people who, whose uh, the light bulb is coming on as to what a streaming app is the little device you put by your TV. We have free apps. It doesn't cost a thing for your Roku, your Amazon fire stick, your Apple TV. And we'll have that out there. Uh, over the course of the next couple of hours, which I appreciate that. And by the way, it's, it's, it's the wave of the future. It's like the end of the aviator. It's the wave of the future. Well, the you know, night, uh, yeah. Well, I was just Go going ahead. to say you were doing a, a coverage weather coverage the other night and our electricity went off. And you know, the first thing I did, I went to the news nine app. I was able to follow what was happening. And, and watching David Payne and that team work those stories and keep us informed. And if I did not have, if I didn't have the app, right. it was going to be pretty darn difficult to follow what was going on. Right. hundred percent. You know, uh, Mark Cuban is, was always a fan of saying that he wasn't worried about digital because ultimately people will come to the biggest screen. The streaming app allows you to watch news nine news on six from anywhere in the world, right there on your TV. But when you need it, Sometimes the smallest screen is what you got to go with. And when you're going to the storm shelter, you can watch the broadcast there just as you would on your couch. And you could go on there and see that this morning's hot seat with Ryan uh, yeah. Martinez, which is talking about the tourism uh, audit and the tourism committee rather that's about to meet. We have that uh, there on the app. I'm sure soon. And also uh, tomorrow morning, your vote counts representative Martinez 
and Representative Cindy Munson are sitting in and talk about newsmakers. So the A team is off somewhere this weekend, Representative Martinez, who's chairing that special investigative committee, investigative committee on tourism. He's my Republican tomorrow morning on your vote counts somewhere around sometime in the morning. You know, it's, I, I've never, I, I tape them. I never see them live. I see them on the app. So, all right, Mr. Wilton, thanks so much for this. Thanks for watching. I think we have one more of these before school's out, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's summer vacation for everybody. Well, except for these schools that are working 12 months, you know, That's out right. of the year. That's right. So, well, thanks to all of our guests and a special thanks to Ryan Wilton and all the team in digital. Um, Nathan, I know he's working today because I'll get notes from him shortly. That's right. Nate is working. All right. So glad you joined us. Send me an email if you wish. Scott at Mitchell Talks. We'll be here on, uh, you'll see your book counts tomorrow. Monday night, we're going to be doing a News Watch Oklahoma. We'll probably be talking about that Swalley's investigation and where we're headed for the next couple of weeks in terms of the legislative session. It may not be, it, the weather looks smooth. I'm not sure the legislative session is going to finish up real smooth. That's what we'll be talking about Monday night, 7 p.m. On behalf of Ryan Welton, this is Scott Mitchell saying have a great weekend, everyone.